right, let me start off. Um, you probably all will understand why we think this topic of early detection is important, um, but let me just highlight a few things in the research literature. Um, one is that the average age of identification of autism in the United States is still over four years of age. Um, and it's actually stayed over four years of age for two solid decades. So even though I'm gonna describe some uh, major advances that we've made now in early diagnosis of autism, it isn't helping bring down the age of diagnosis and it's really not clear why um, that's the case. The average age that parents first go to somebody, like first go to their pediatrician um, and say that they're a little bit worried about their child is 18 months. That's the average age. So roughly half of parents bring it up earlier than 18 months um, with 30 to 50% reporting concerns even at their child's first birthday. So there's this really large gap in between where parents notice something going awry and when they get the diagnosis. Um, and this is a big problem because if you aren't um, identified yet with autism, you're not gonna get access to the treatments that we know really, really can improve outcome. Um, and that's, of course, why we're doing this work. So how can we get better at picking up autism in infancy? And what we really need to understand is if the symptoms or the manifestations of it are similar in 12-month-olds, 14-month-olds, 15-month-olds, as they are in children who are three or four. Um, and this is because our diagnostic criteria were originally written um, 30, 40 years ago when no infants were ever diagnosed. So we really need to better understand what the manifestations are early in life. Up until a couple of decades ago, there were really only a couple of ways we could investigate early symptoms. Um, one was that we would interview parents and ask them to try to remember back before their child was diagnosed, sometimes even two or three years before they were diagnosed, and what they were like. And we would say, you know, well, do you remember um, when did he point? Or when did she first um, start imitating you? Or things like that. Now, for anybody who's a parent, you'll recognize that those are really hard things to pinpoint um, when they happened and how they unfolded over time. Most of us, even those of us in the field, really can't remember that very accurately. So that's a problem. Um, the other method that had been used to really try to zoom in and see what symptoms of, in, of autism might look like in infancy is to analyze home movies that parents had taken, you know, for their own personal purposes to document their child growing up. Um, but that also has limitations. Up until at least fairly recently with smartphones, not everybody did videotape their child. And for those of us who did, most of us would, you know, just not want to record when our child wasn't acting the way we thought would be really cute and fun to send to the grandparents and things like that. So you'd record over it when it was on VHS, or now you just hit the little um, trash can icon on your phone and you delete the video that might be showing actual symptoms or behaviors that are problematic. So neither of these methods were really very helpful in um, understanding more about what autism looks like in infancy. However, in the last two decades, um, we've started doing um, research prospectively where we study children who are at risk for autism prior to the development of symptoms. So this means really very shortly after birth. And we follow them through the window of when we know autism symptoms unfold so we can watch it unfold um, in real time. And this, this is what we call prospective research. Um, we use a, um, a method in which we compare a, an infant born into a family that already has at least one child with autism um, and therefore is at higher risk for developing autism themselves two infants who are born into families that don't have any children with autism um, and therefore are at sort of average risk. And we've been engaged in such a study here at UC Davis for over 15 years now. Um, very, very fortunate to have been funded multiple times um, and to study three large groups of children. So our first cohort, we were 
um, funded in 2003 to 2008, um, along with UCLA. So we did this as a collaborative project across the two sites, and we enrolled 350 infants, saw them at five ages. In our second cohort from 2008 to 2013, um, we went it alone, so we weren't working with UCLA then. Um, we added two visit points because we realized that we were missing some really important information. So we started studying the children when they were also nine and 15 months, along with the other five data points that we were getting in our first cohort. So we saw 200 children then. And finally, in our third cohort, we just finished um, a couple a month ago, I think, um, we saw another 200 children and we were back down to five visits. Um, and that, then we've also been really fortunate to gain funding to continue seeing many of these children um, as they've gotten older. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what they're like as they, as they do get older. So the oldest kids in our study right now are 15 years of age and I see at least one mother who has, I think, a 14 year old. Um, and so I have to, thank the families who have been so committed to this study. We've had some people here um, up to 10 or 12 times now over these years. So let me tell you about the study. That We had three main goals, the ones I'll talk about today. First is, as I've already discussed, to understand how symptoms emerge early in infancy. Um, the second is we really wanted to understand how likely is it that a family will have a second child with autism if they've already had one. Because parents, that's one of the very first things they ask when you're diagnosing their child is, what's the risk to any future children that they might have? And then the third is, what other um, difficulties or challenges might be faced by a sibling of a child with autism um, if he or she doesn't develop autism themselves? Are there other things that we need to be on the lookout for and maybe help families deal with? So I'll start with this first one. Um, we have a really broad assessment battery that we use in our study. Because when we first started the study, we really didn't know what autism was going to look like in infancy, and so we had to cast a pretty wide net. We obviously are going to focus on some of the areas that we know are central to autism, like language, social development, repetitive behaviors, things like that. Um, but we also wanted to look at motor development. We wanted to look at how the child handles objects and understands objects. Um, we wanted to look at how they process visual stimuli. So we have a really broad battery um, in this study. And I'm gonna show you a couple of video tapes just quickly so you get a sense of what one of these sessions looks like and what some of our measures look like. The first one I'm gonna show you um, is a task called the Early Social Communication Scale, and it's one um, that elicits a lot of different social behaviors, things like eye contact, facial expressions, gestures, many behaviors that are really social to early autism, or sorry, central to early autism. Mm -hmm. So these are gonna be both 12-month-old infants. You're gonna see. Yeah. This little boy is 15 now. Uh -huh. he's, he's looking at the examiner. He smiles at her. He sort of makes some little comments. Shows her something. Do you want some help? He has a very expressive face. Lots of facial expressions. and good use of gestures. And then here's a baby at risk for autism, same task. So I think you could see in that clip some really clear differences between those two infants. They're both within two weeks of their um, first birthday. 
The second boy um, was quiet, so he didn't make any vocalizations at all. He didn't use any gestures. He didn't show anything. Um, he never looked at the adult. He only looked at the object, so he was a very object um, interested, but not as interested in humans. Um, he didn't have any facial expressions, so we, I think we could infer he was really interested in that toy by how he looked at it, but he never um, smiled, he didn't try to um, share his interest with the examiner, and he didn't even make any sort of facial movements to indicate interest. So that's what some of our social tasks look like. We also have a task um, where we look at how they use objects. Let me show you that. Same two boys. So we give, them, we give them objects that we think um, will provide opportunities to maybe use them in repetitive ways like children with autism do. Um, so you can see he's not doing anything particularly creative or symbolic with it, um, but he isn't also doing anything terribly repetitive with it. That is actually the number one behavior, is dropping it over the edge and looking at it and waiting for the examiner to retrieve it. And in between doing all those things, he kept looking up at the examiner and stepping in with her and things like that. So he's doing a lot of like spinning and wobbling of the object. He's staring at the object a lot, sort of probably looking at the um, shiny surfaces of it, and then he's rotating it and visually inspecting both sides. And those are some of the behaviors we do often see in older children with autism. Well, the purpose of that task, in fact, was to see if infants engage in some of those same kinds of repetitive behaviors that we see in older children with autism. So. In our study, we have focused really on three particular methods for trying to study how the early symptoms emerge. One of them is that we take all these videos that, similar to the ones I've just showed you, and we have a really dedicated, wonderful group of undergraduates who painstakingly learn how to identify particular behaviors um, on videotape, and then they sit sort of chained to computers and spend time counting the exact frequency of particular social behaviors. So we teach them how to recognize eye contact, how to recognize vocalizations, how to recognize um, gestures, how to recognize facial expressions like smiles and negative affect and things like that. And so they can um, come up with these exact frequency counts of how often certain behaviors occur on the video. Now, if a child is developing autism, what we might expect is that um, before they have autism, they would have high frequencies of the social behaviors, and as the autism is onsetting, those social behaviors would drop in frequency. That's basically the, the hypothesis. So that's one of the methods we use. Um, a second method is that we have examiners um, who have a lot of clinical expertise, but we keep them unaware of which risk group the child is in, so they don't know if they have an older sibling with autism or not, um, and we keep them um, unaware of all the previous testing history. So they don't know if we thought that child might have autism the last time they came or were concerning in any way. And the examiners do um, careful ratings of the child's social behavior at every single visit. And then the last is that we have parents do similar kinds of ratings. All of the analyses I'm about to show you come, um, are done by two really wonderful biostatisticians in my lab. Um, Greg Young and Anna Maria Yosef, who I know is here. Um, so thank you to them because all of the really cool data we have is due to their expertise. What we have plotted here are um, 
two different graphs, one showing that first cohort of children and then the second showing our um, cohorts two and three. And we've plotted how often in the videotapes taken in our labs the child makes eye contact, basically. So what you can see is in red here um, are the children who develop autism. And then, I think this is black, it's hard to see, are the children who go on to have typical development. And we use that same color scheme over here, typical development in black, and we have a, another group here that are children who are at high risk for autism but don't develop autism themselves. So what you can see is when we um, plot how much eye contact they make, at six months, the group that is gonna develop autism and the group that is gonna be typical at 36 months, they have about the same number of glances up at the examiner. So they're making about the same rate of eye contact at six months. But the children who go on to have typical development, they keep the le same level of eye contact between six and 36 months, whereas the children who are developing autism, they drop in how frequently they look at other people over time. And so this um, is what we've come to call declining trajectories. And I'm gonna now show you, I think, four slides that show this basic phenomenon of declining frequency um, over time of different behaviors. So here we have a fully independent cohort, um, two cohorts actually combined, but you can see that the graphs are basically the same shape. At six months, there are not differences between the groups who go on to have autism and who don't, um, but the group with ultimately diagnosed with autism at 36 months shows this very sharp decline in their eye contact over time, whereas the other two groups maintain a stable level of eye contact. And these aren't ratings, these are exact frequencies from videotapes, so they're very precise measurements. Um, the second, uh, paper here is in preparation by one of our postdocs, um, Devin Ganji, in the, in the lab. Now, coding all that video is very painstaking. It's very time intensive, labor intensive, and expensive. And so we needed to come up with some other methods to see if we could also replicate the decline. And that's um, plotted here. We use these ratings by examiners. And you can see basically the same phenomenon. This is in cohort one, which we published in 2010, um, the individuals who are typical and then the individuals who have autism. Um, and this is a rating, an overall rating of three social behaviors that the examiners do at the end of each visit. Same exact um, sort of shape to the graph. We see that the examiners over time are rating the child as having less and less social abilities. Um, and this is an independent sample, cohorts two and three. We just published this data um, earlier this year. Same decline in social engagement and um, flat or increasing levels in the children who are typical. And then finally, and I think most importantly for developing screening tools, we wanted to see if the same decline was evident when parents did the ratings. Because parents are the ones, obviously, who are going to be in the future and for future children filling out screening questionnaires and things like that in their doctor's offices. And so we wanted to know if the same phenomenon would be, a, would be evident. And you can see again that it is. These are two different measures, one that we developed in our lab, the early development questionnaire, and then a second um, that is a commercially available and widely used screening tool called the Infant Toddler Checklist. And this work is um, done by Chani Parikh, who is a postdoc in my lab too. Same phenomenon. The children are very equivalent at six months on both measures. Over time, typical kids flat or increasing rates of social engagement as rated by the parents. The children with autism declining declining, increasing. Um, so we've now sort of replicated this across multiple different cohorts, multiple different methods, and multiple different measures. Um, and so we really feel like this declining trajectory is telling us that over time, children with autism have skills that are at pretty high rates early in life that drop over time. Um, now, what I have done here is aggregated all this data across all the children in the autism group. And what we don't know is maybe did just a few children with like a really large regression um, 
affect this, you know, they're outliers, and so they affect the graph so that um, we get this declining phenomenon, but it's really only driven by a few kids. So we use a special kind of uh, method called latent class analysis, and this is Ana Maria, she's here in the back, um, who does, does these analyses for us. And what it does is um, has the computer essentially help us figure out how many children are showing certain types of trajectories and how many are showing other types. So we don't, we don't rely upon us looking at the data and deciding if we think that's a decline or if we think it isn't. We actually let the computer do the classification. So what we have here are the children who are typically developing and the children who are typically developing in the high risk group. And then we have this declining trajectory and a flat sort of early onset trajectory. What um, is apparent here is that 90% of the children in the autism group, 88%, fall on that declining trajectory. So what that shows us is that it really isn't just a few outliers that are determining this declining trajectory, but that the majority of the children in the autism group are losing skills over time. We used to think that regression was actually a pretty um, uncommon phenomenon in autism. We thought it might be only about 20 to 25% of children showed a regression, but this data really shows us that whether it's rated um, by parents or you know, we, with different measures, that it's the majority of the children that are showing this phenomenon. Another way we look at how symptoms onset is um, we do sort of a chart review. Every time the child comes in, they get classified um, into sort of one of three different categories. Either that there are no concerns um, with the child, and that means that um, the examiners have no concerns, the parents have no concerns, all the standardized testing is in the normal range, um, that kind of thing. That's um, on this heat map, that very pale pink. Then the slightly darker pink is if there are some concerns. So one of those, one of the things I said isn't the case. Somebody has concerns, parent or examiner, or some of the measures are starting to go out of the, um, out of the average range. And then the dark red here is once they're diagnosed. This is all, every single child is represented by a line here who developed autism. Um, and what you can see is that at six months, the vast, vast majority of the children um, who go on to have autism have no concerns and all their testings in the average range. Um, just a very few who have some concerns. But by 12 months, about half of the children are starting to show some symptoms and two, only two, um, of whom one of them was that little boy in the video I showed you earlier, have gotten diagnosed. Um, then at 18 months, pretty much everybody, with just a few exceptions, are starting to show symptoms. But still, only about half are diagnosed. 24 months, about three quarters are diagnosed. Just a few kids now who still look typical. And then obviously at 36 months, because that's the last point in the study, they're all diagnosed. And so just that kind of heat map, I think, is just another way of looking at this emergence over time and that most of the kids are starting off as very typical early on. Um, this is, I'm not gonna go through all of our measures, but this is a table that compares the children and there are now um, 62 children, I think, who have developed autism in the study. So it compares them to the low-risk infants and where, where there's a check mark, it indicates that they are significantly different and significantly lower than the low-risk infants. And so you can see at six months, there are no differences. Um, where we have a dark cell here, it just means we don't collect that measure at that age. But on all the other measures, there are no significant differences. But by 12 months, <laughs> It's almost, looks like you faked that data there. Um, but by 12 months, every single measure, um, they're st statistically significantly lower on. Um, and so that's, I guess, another version of this decline over time, another way to see it. Um, these findings have been replicated by lots of other independent research teams, so I just throw that up there to show you that. Um, and one paper that was published recently, or actually not that recently anymore, but by Ami Klin's group at, um, at Emory in Nature, so this is a very um, high prestige journal, showed a very similar kind of decline over time, and this was using a completely different method than we've used, which was eye tracking. 
Um, to summarize our first sort of goal of the infant study, what do prospective studies reveal about how autism starts? Well, there's first a couple of different things. Um, it emerges over time. Um, it isn't present at birth, which is what Leo Connor, who first described autism, said back in the 1940s. Um, symptoms emerge over the first three years of life, and they emerge at different times for different children, largely in the first three years of life. So that's one takeaway message. Um, a second is that we really think that this regressive onset, this decline um, in frequency of social and communication behaviors over time is the rule. It's not the exception. It's not just a few children with autism um, show a regression, a, a low percentage, but it's most of them. And why does that matter? Well. It matters because parents can report on this declining trajectory, too, over time. Um, and if they can do that, there's a lot of um, promise for longitudinal screening. Currently, the way screening is done is it's just done twice, um, if you're lucky, in your pediatrician's office. But if we could implement practices where screening was done at every single visit, you'd be able to see the children whose scores are starting to go down. And maybe we could catch them as they're declining or starting to decline um, because they're dropping off their percentile, you know, very similar to how we track percentiles for head circumference or height or weight in well child visits. If you could see that they'd always been on the 50th percentile and now they're starting to drop lower and lower, you might be able to catch children in the middle of their um, decline. And why that's important is that then we could intervene. So if we could pick up children before they have the full disorder, um, maybe we could do preventative interventions that would alter the trajectory a little bit and help them have different outcomes and improve their functioning over time. So that's really the holy grail for us now, is trying to figure out who is going to go into this decline either prior to it happening or just as it's starting. Second goal of the study um, is to understand what families' risks are for having another child with autism if they've already had one. So when we first applied for our grant back in 2002, um, the estimates of recurrence risk were between 3 and 10 percent. Um, and this was higher than the population rate, which at that time was lower than it is now, um, was probably about half a percent. Currently, the population rate is about 1.5 percent of the population. So we already knew it was elevated, um, the risk of having a second child with it, but we didn't know how much. We were very fortunate to be part of a group called the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, the BSRC, which is a collective group of um, in studies across the world that are using this infant sibling design, this prospective design. And we aggregate all our data into a database specifically so that we can answer questions that you can't really answer in any one individual study alone. And so this particular paper, um, that I'm going to describe the findings of in just a moment, um, was aggregated across over 600 high-risk infants and 300 low-risk infants across 12 sites um, in North America. So what did we find? Um, first of all, we found that the recurrence risk was much higher than previous estimates. And actually, this is from 2011. We've, we frankly think it's probably even higher again now. Um, but when we did this in 2011, we found that almost 20 percent of siblings um, of children with autism went on to, to, to develop autism, so much higher than the 3 to 10 percent rate. We also looked at what predicted, um, what factors might predict who was going to um, have a recurrence. And we looked at a whole lot of variables. Um, the most powerful was simply the sex of the infant. So if it was a male infant, they had a much higher recurrence rate than female infants. So the boys um, who have an older sibling with autism have a much higher rate of developing autism than girls. Um, and you can even see it's higher in boys in the low risk group um, a little bit. And that makes sense because autism is much more common in boys. So that wasn't a surprise. The second factor that predicted recurrence was whether the family had more than one child with autism prior to the infant that we were seeing in the study. So there was um, a 
group, I think it was about 12 to 15 percent of this sample um, that had either two children with autism, um, a few had three children with autism, and I believe one family had four children with autism prior to enrolling this new baby. Um, and so we found that the rates were much, much higher in the multiplex families. So that's the families that have more than one child. And so over on this graph here, these are all um, in the high-risk group, um, but what I've plotted here are um, for males, if they have more than one sibling with autism, um, and, sorry, males over here, and just one sibling with autism, just one, and same for females. And so you can see that if they have one sibling with autism, their rate is about half of if they have um, more than one sibling. And then when you combine the two, male and multiplex, you can see that if uh, a male infant is born into a family that already has two or more children with autism, their risk was close to 50% for developing autism themselves, which is a really, really high and alarming rate. We did look at lots of other factors. We looked at practically everything you could think of, that we could think of, and nothing else predicted which children were going to develop autism. So we looked at um, a number of things we didn't think would make any difference, um, like the family's economic level or race or ethnicity. We did look at some things that had been shown in other studies to predict recurrence, but in this one it did not, which was how old the parents were. Um, we looked at um, what birth order they were, what the older child's um, sex with autism was, so if the older child with autism was a boy versus a girl. We looked at whether the older sib with autism was higher functioning and had language or didn't have language. None of these things predicted risk. The only things that did in that study were if it was a male baby and if they had more than one child with autism already. And then our third goal was um, to think a little bit more about once we figured out if the child has autism or not, the new sibling, is there anything else they might be at risk for that we could help families get intervention for earlier? It was already known, in fact, it has been known really for, for several, for many years, several decades even, that um, families of children with autism are at higher risk for a number of things, not just autism itself, but um, social challenges like shyness, um, speech and language disorders, dyslexia, depression, anxiety disorders, and ADHD. So all of these were known um, as occurring at higher rates in families who have a child with autism than in families of a child with other disorders, for example, like Down syndrome or Tourette syndrome. So we have an opportunity in this study now to see if that's replicated in a prospective sample, number one, and number two, when they develop over time, because we're studying these siblings from birth. At 36 months, um, as I already told you, the rate of autism is about 17%. Um, the rate of other outcomes, and we've just grouped these together into something we call non-typical development, um, is actually another quarter of the sample, so 28%. And this breaks down at 36 months to be um, some 14% of the children had some um, social development challenges. Um, about 7% had speech and language disorders. 5% we thought might be developing ADHD, although it's not typically going to be diagnosed then. Um, and a very small proportion, 2%, we thought might have um, be at risk for intellectual disability. And so we, we identified them with global developmental delay across a variety of areas. Um, and you can see the rates are much, much lower in the low risk group. So 88% of that group is typical. We have about 9% who share these kind of difficulties um, compared to 28% and then just about 1% have autism. We've seen them back a couple of times now, um, and thank you to all the parents who are coming over and over again. Um, Megan Miller, who was at the time a postdoc in my lab and now is an assistant professor here 
at UC Davis did this work. Um, so we followed the kids up when they were six to seven years old, and we have a pretty similar rate of autism still. Um, the rate of this non-typical development, it's roughly the same. It's just a little bit higher. It was 28%, but now it's 32%. So about a third of the siblings have some other problems, social difficulties. This is, um, was sort of surprising to us. So about 10% have ADHD, um, and then various other other difficulties, and it's all much higher than you see in the low-risk group. And now we're seeing them again. This is ongoing. Uh, we've seen about a third of the sample at this point, and we have a similar rate of autism, um, but now you can see that this group that we call non-typical or that have other challenges has even grown higher. So it was 32% when they were six to seven, now it's 50%. And partially what's accounting for that is that there are certain conditions like anxiety and mood disorders that really are very rarely diagnosed in six-year-olds or in three-year-olds particularly. These are things already known to develop over time um, and in fact we haven't even really hit the highest risk period, which is adolescence, for these disorders. But you can see, um, I think on the previous slide, only 1% of the sample was diagnosed with an anxiety or a mood disorder, and now um, it's 14% at this age. And this is something we already knew ran in the families. Um, mostly we had evaluated it in the parents um, previously, but now we see that the siblings are also at high risk for those disorders. Um, dyslexia we're seeing in a fair number of children. And then this, again, is still climbing. So the rate of ADHD is now 17% of the siblings who don't develop autism have ADHD. Um, and again, you can see the rates are much higher than they are in the low risk group. This 28% is accounted for by some of the same things, but they're all lower. So ADHD, 11%, um, anxiety and mood disorders, 6%. Um, learning disabilities is, a bit, is actually a bit higher in the low risk group, but not much. Here we've plotted um, just for the high risk group in yellow is uh, their rates at three years, six to seven years in green, and then in gray, the rates of the disorders at nine to 14 years. And so you can see over on the left side here that certain things persist over time. So they're basically the same rates um, at all three ages. But then other things are really increasing, learning disabilities, ADHD, and anxiety and depression. So the challenges are persisting and enduring or emerging over time. And so where does this take us? I think one of the, one of the big take home messages for us has been, it's great news when we realize that your child doesn't have autism, one of the siblings, but we need to be on the lookout for other things because all of these things are highly treatable. They're not treatable if they're not identified. So that having a child with autism in your family puts other siblings at high risk for a number of things that we need to keep our eye on. Currently, the uh, practice recommendations are that primary care providers should ask parents at every visit if they have any concerns about the child. Um, and regardless of what they say, at 18 and 24 months, they should do a formal autism screen. And this was something that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended over a decade ago. It's um, slow to uptake, I think, and so not all pediatricians are fully doing this, but it's, it's getting better over time. The, these are some red flags that come from not only our work, but also the work of um, collectively the Baby Siblings Research Consortium. Um, the children, if they aren't doing some of these behaviors at these times, really should be getting referrals for somebody to do a comprehensive developmental assessment. Um, so six to nine months, looking at people, smiling at people, some of the things I highlighted in the talk already, nine to 12 months, not responding to their name, not starting to do consonant vowel babbling, um, not showing bright affect on their faces. Um, and then at 12 to 18 months, they should be pointing, showing things to people, starting to use words, being really interested in other children. There are screening tools that are available um, for infancy. So the infant toddler checklist I talked about briefly earlier, and we use it in our study too. This goes all the way down to six months of age. 
It um, has norms online so that people can go online. Um, it's open access. You can download a copy. You can check your score. Um, you can use it if you're a practitioner. However, what, what studies have basically shown for both of these measures, the infant toddler checklist and the MCHAT, which are two widely used screening tools, is that the earlier you use them, the um, more false positives there are, so the more um, children get high scores when really there's, they're okay, um, but also the more false negatives there are and that it fails to identify lots of kids who actually do have emerging symptoms. And so the field collectively has been really trying to think about ways to do early screening better and to improve the measures that we have. One of the ways is using um, video. And in this very room on a Wednesday night um, during the Distinguished Lecture Series, probably, did I write when it was? No, I think it's probably around five or eight years ago, John Constantino was giving a talk, a Distinguished Lecture talk, and he talked about the need to start um, using video, he calls them anchors, um, for screening so that parents can see in a video, here's what the behavior I'm about to ask you looks like. And so you illustrate it with the video and then you do the screening. And he um, described a study that got published in 2015 where they did that. They showed um, just one video clip of a really socially competent toddler and then they said, okay, so that's how it should look. Now, rate your child compared to that child. And so while he was saying that, and I was sitting out there, I just had this idea. And I thought like, wow, we have thousands of videos of children because everything we do in the lab gets videotaped. And they come from, for five to seven visits, <clears throat> pardon me, and we have you know, over 500 infants who've been in the study, and multiply that times three hours for each visit, and you can parse each video up into seconds. We literally, we calculated, had over 10,000 video clips. And so we thought, wow, we could make the measure even better without just having one video clip. We could come up with you know, a whole video library that would illustrate all these behaviors. And so that's what we did. So in collaboration with John Constantino, who is a friend of mine I'd known for a long time, I ran up after the talk and I said, hey, would you want to collaborate on a study? And we luckily um, were funded by Autism Speaks and NIH to develop a video-based screening measure, and we call it the VERSA video referenced infant rating system for autism. And so what it does um, is it's, first of all, um, used at only four ages so far. We hope to develop it for older ages later. Um, it takes 20 second video clips and it pairs them right next to each other. It has parents watch the two videos to contrast each other um, and they're of babies in our lab playing with their moms. Um, we give them some instructions. Here's what to look for. Here's how to do the ratings. Um, and then we just, after they watch the video, say, click on the one that looks more like your child. Let me show you what that looks like. Is it stuck? Oh. Hey, Mr. Man. Uh. Oh, God. The beep, 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 beep. They watch the first clip. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's this? Wow. Wow. What's this? What's this turn? Eyes. So the parents watch the two, and then they click on the one that's more like their child. And then, depending on which video they click on, they get a new set of pairs, and it's individualized for every single parent and every search. So now they're gonna see a new set. Um, these videos are all on a continuum of one to 10, and we try to sort of narrow down um, the searches by presenting videos that are tailored to what the parent is um, is selecting. 
So in the first video, they, they picked one that was the child who was making less eye contact um, and sort of interacting less. They did that again on this video. And so now they're getting a new set of videos that are even more narrowly But you get the idea. So we started that about five years ago, and we just had our very last um, participant come in for testing last month. And so we have hot off the press results for how this is working. And we're really excited about it. Oh, and I actually, I neglected to tell you that parents um, fill this out over, um, or at home online, so it's completely web-based. They do it before they come into the visit so that nothing they see during the visit might contaminate their ratings. And then at the end of the visit, the examiners also do it. And so we get the examiner's input too. We have the examiner sort of pretend as if it's their child and rate them. And what you could see here, so we have the standard six to, this is 18 months, um, plotted here. These are the children who are gonna be diagnosed with autism at 36 months in the red, and then the other two groups that I've been showing you over and over, the children with typical development who either are in the high-risk group or the low-risk group. And what you could see is that the parent ratings of the children who are gonna develop autism are lower all the way across the board, even at six months. Um, and by nine months, it's statistically significant. So they're rating their children lower on this video-based measure um, in a way that statistically predicts which have autism as early as nine months. The examiners, um, it's similar. They, um, at nine months of age, the examiner ratings of the children who are go gonna go on to have autism are significantly lower than the other two groups. So we think this rating system actually um, might improve on the paper and pencil measures that are most widely used in screening tools. So um, we like it for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very low burden. Um, it only takes seven minutes to do, so it's quick. It's interesting, it's engaging, because it's video-based. And it's web-based, so if we find that this really does work well, it could be something that could be provided on the internet to any family, to provide access to anyone who doesn't um, live near the Mind Institute or live near a large metropolitan area that has a university autism center. Um, and so what we're doing now, and I don't know if any families are here who are part of this study, is we're testing it on a really large community sample. So we, we learned that it works well in families who already have a child with autism, right? These are high risk families. What we don't know is if you don't have any experience with autism, none, you know, there is no autism in your family, will the measure still be useful for you? And so that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to come up with a method that would take the video, and for now we're using the video that we've acquired in our laboratory, um, but would take that video and um, come up with an automated way to quantify the amount of eye contact that a child's making, and also to quantify their vocalizations and their facial expressions. Um, and there are some really cool um, computer methods uh, known as machine learning or computer vision analysis, which is far beyond me to try to explain to any of you. Um, but where you take the, the computer and you train it on videos and the computer learns to recognize certain patterns and then can detect whether, you know, whatever behavior it is you're trying to train the computer to do. And so we're working with a um, computer engineer across the causeway um, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering named Samson Chung. And he is helping us develop neural network models that can detect um, whether a child's making eye contact. So the way it works is we input the video and it figures out where the mother is, where the child is, and where the child's gaze is focused. Um, and we, it, we actually also have a way that it detects where the objects are. And then it sort of puts a heat map together and looks at 
if the child's gaze is focused over in the bounding box for where the mother's head is. And that's what we use for our automated way of detecting whether the child's making eye contact. So the green is indicating where the computer says the child's gaze is going. And you could, so we could tell, are they looking down at the objects? Are they looking at an object the mother holds? Or are they looking at the mother? And she's just masked here for now, but we have a very similar model that does this same thing with the mother's head. And then looks to see if the gazes are in the same direction. So that's sort of what that looks like in, in real time. Um, now, why would this be neat to do? First of all, it would save a lot of time in research. So the things that I've shown you um, where we looked at gaze frequency, that took five years to code. Um, the, it's very, very labor intensive. It's also like really boring, I think, for the undergraduates who do it. It's very expensive. So it would be a wonderful tool for research. But more excitingly, I think, and where we would really like to see this going, is if we could get something that really had high accuracy in detecting eye gaze, we could have parents upload videos rather than fill out screening questionnaires um, where they could upload videos over a time period and we could look to see if eye contact was declining over time. And so that's sort of the general idea of where we're trying to have this go in the future and we're busily writing grants right now to try to do that. I'm going to finish here just with a few resources for families. Um, there are several really wonderful books that I'd like to recommend um, for you. If you're at the stage where you're not sure if your child might be on the spectrum, um, this book, even though it's a little bit older, is really nice because it's focused on infants and toddlers. Um, so I would recommend that book. This book is a very helpful activity book if your child's showing some risk signs. They might not be diagnosed yet, um, but their social development or their language development might not be quite where we would like it to be, and so maybe they've been identified as either by the parent or the pediatrician as, being, um, as needing a little bit of help. These are some things you can just build into your everyday life um, to work with your child and to help stimulate their social and language development. Um, but it isn't specifically for children with autism. Um, and then the third book, written by one of my colleagues, who I'm sure is in the audience, but I didn't, can't see her. She's behind the camera there, um, is by Sally Rogers and coll colleagues Geraldine Dawson and Lori Vismara. Um, and this is a wonderful book filled with activities for very young children, newly diagnosed children with autism. Also, um, things you can embed in just natural household routines to try to stimulate your child's development. And then I would certainly recommend the Autism Speaks website. They have three um, really helpful toolboxes that you can go to that um, provide guidance on what should you do in the first 100 days after your child is diagnosed, um, what are the earliest signs, and then it has a video glossary um, of symptoms that you can go look at. I want to thank, um, in particular, our funders. We have been extremely, extremely fortunate to be funded multiple times now um, to follow this large group of children, um, and so we're very grateful for that. I really have to give a call out to my team, a bunch of whom are here. It's an amazing team. People work so hard. They work so well with families. I am so grateful to them every day for what they've helped us accomplish. And then especially to the families. The families have been in this study f between three and 15 years. They're extremely committed. Um, we have them fill out really long, boring, stacks of questionnaires um, and come to the MIND Institute over and over and over again. And so I can't express my gratitude enough to all of you. I was looking at um, the pie chart you had of the 9 to 14 year olds with the, um, the typical development, non-typical, and autism. And I was noticing on the breakdown of the 50% non-typical development um, that that added up to 50%. And I was kind of surprised that you don't have multiple diagnoses, so you don't have 
um, children with both ADHD and social difficulties listed there? And I wanted to ask about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So all we did here is put in what we consider their primary outcome. For every visit, um, they can have up to two outcomes, and then oftentimes they actually have three or four, and we just have to pencil those in at the bottom of our outcome sheet. But all I did plot here was their primary outcome, and you are absolutely right that very often they have multiple outcomes. So it's not uncommon at all. Somebody will have learning disabilities primary, ADHD secondary, or they might even have autism primary and something else secondary or whatever, anxiety primary, depression secondary. So yes, very good point. Thanks for helping me clarify that. So you were making the point that um, one of your takeaways from the earlier slides was that autism is not present at birth. As way, uh, the way that Leo Kanner and others thought it was. Yet we know that autism is genetically carried, and even your own data looking at the, uh, the data with multiplex families is, is certainly belies that. And we know that there's things that we know about early brain development in autism that happens in utero, right? So um, I know that you think about this, so I'd love to hear you talk about your statement that autism is not present at birth, versus what we know about the early underpinnings of autism, that is early gestational underpinnings and the sort of genetic components of autism. So absolutely, and, and probably I should have phrased it a little more carefully to say that we don't think behavioral signs, behavioral signs, um, are, are evident early on. It is absolutely true what Susan just um, her quick lit review of the early um, neurobiology and genetics and things of autism is absolutely true. So probably the underlying biological mechanisms that are going to ultimately cascade into um, behavioral signs of autism over the next six to 36 months are there, absolutely. And I should have probably said it more carefully. Um, but what isn't there is, are the behavioral signs. So for a long time, people sort of said, well, how could we really tell if the behavioral signs are there? Because a lot of the behavioral signs aren't even um, evident in any infants, much less, you know, so how would you be able to tell if they're missing in a child with autism? Like, you know, six month olds don't imitate they don't use gestures yet, they don't talk yet, et cetera. So how could you tell if those behaviors were missing? And what we really have focused on in our research and, and um, most of the data that I showed is on behaviors that are present in the first year of life at very high rates. So the rates of looking at people and social smiling and responding to name are close to 100% by nine months of age, 12 months of age. So if they're lower than that, you can, in a child who might be developing autism, you can differentiate them from the kids who are typically developing. So we have tried to concentrate on behaviors like that where we can say with some confidence that, you know, those behaviors are declining over time because they should be at very high rates in those children. So yeah, that's, I think, what I was trying to say. And the reason I think it's really useful to know this beyond academic interest, obviously, is that it helps us, it gives us another tool for identification. So change over time and dropping over time might be even more powerful for detection than any single score at any single age, and particularly any single score at a much older age. So if we could see these declining scores longitudinally early on, maybe it'll give us a hint of who's in the beginning stages of developing autism. Since the signs are starting about at six months of age, I was just curious because I have a lot of, um, like a, a couple family members and friends who um, their children didn't develop or start showing the signs at the six mark, marks age and they were correlating it to, oh, they had just got their shots. And so, and we know that correlation isn't, isn't causation, but so I was just curious, when you guys do your studies, do you take that into consideration too? Do you take like account of and ask the parents, like, how, did you guys um, vaccinate or did you not vaccinate without getting into the, the whole debate? I was just curious about that. Yes, uh, thank you for that. It's a really important point. So, so there's two things to sort of reflect on. The first is that the timing of vaccinations is in this exact same period 
And so the question is then, is that a coincidence or, or not? And that has led to a lot of debate in the, in the media, as I'm sure you know, and in the minds of the public. Um, there have been many studies that have shown in a variety of different methods, um, different ways that vaccinations don't cause autism. Um, and so here we do collect that information. It goes into a really large database and it is, um, used in some of the analyses to look at, um, but we haven't found, again, a, a link. Most of the children are actually getting vaccinated, um, but the rates of you know, getting vaccinated in the highest group and those who do and don't develop autism is almost identical. And so it does look similar to the broader vaccination literature that there isn't a temporal link there. Um, we are planning a big study that comes out of the Baby Siblings Research Consortium because it's the kind of thing you can't do in just a little sample at any one site um, where they're going to look at that as well. But so far, the results of this kind of research pretty much have mirrored the larger literature and really not thinking that the two are causal. This is just really amazing and I just want to commend you and your team for it's just incredible work really. It's just very easy to process too. Um, can you go back to your slide that showed the check marks at different age points and which variables showed a difference between the groups? I think it was pretty far back. Sorry, I think it just helps if, yeah. to see it um, for my question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I was just really, really impressed by the difference between six months and 12 months. And I know that you've explained that the ones that have check marks are the ones that are significantly different, and that makes sense. But I'm imagining that some are much better differentiators than others, like have much ro more robust differences. And I'm just trying to understand what those are, I guess, first, but then what implications those might have for understanding the very early onset of, not symptoms, but behavioral signs, I guess? Largely, I would say that the best predictors are, are sort of the ones that I presented are some of the simplest ones. The ones that are both strongest and also that we see earliest, like we can see this at nine months in some of our analyses, eye contact frequency. Um, let's see, response to name, that differentiates the groups. I didn't present this, but at nine months also, um, which I don't have plotted on this slide. Actually, repetitive object use also does at nine months. So, sorry, I don't have it here. But are the ones that are, are very similar to the sort of core phenotype of autism and to what we think of even in older children with autism as being the central components of it. And also things that can develop early. So all of those, and I think it's not surprising, show the most robust differences at 12 months, partially because they're just so solid in the typical um, outcome group or the low risk group that like 100% of the kids are getting scores of 100% on all of those variables. So that seeing the children who even have small decrements in frequency in those behaviors, um, th they are the most significant. So yeah, I would say those are the most predictive variables. So looking at like eye contact, so it's very well established early on, it's present from newborns, and then something changes drastically from six to 12 months. How do you, what's the mechanism that you think about when you look at these data? What is changing that is, that is underlying this decrease? Regressions, I mean, that's kind of a funny word. I mean, regression's one word, but when people talk about regression, they usually think about like language disappears. These behaviors aren't disappearing, but they're decreasing. So how do you think of this mechanistically? I mean, it's a great question. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. I, th I feel that probably, sort of coming back to Susan's question, that you know the genes that are involved and the neural circuitry that, it, it, that is involved um, 
you know, support those behaviors and that those genes are being expressed at that time or not expressed at that time um, and leading to decrements in the behaviors over time. It's not a very satisfactory answer. I don't think anyone really understands, you know, why those particular behaviors, why that particular time, um, et cetera. I don't know. I don't really have a, a good answer to that, to be honest. Have you thought about it yourself, and what would you say? I think about all those things as well, but I also think about different um, mechanisms underlying social behaviors at different ages, and the fact that newborns come into the world wired for something, let's say, like imitation, that you can think about that as a different set of neural circuitry that's present in a newborn, so it's got to be a pretty primitive one. And that later on, that goes away. Newborn imitation goes away at three months, not completely, but really decreases. Then it comes back later on, fueled by other kinds of social engagement and other kinds of response. And then what the adult does, or the partner does, is affects that differently. And so I really think about different neural networks that are developmentally develop, you know, developing or changing over time. So there's a shifting base that's uh, maturing, and that those could underlie those differences. Yes, and I would really agree with you in particular things like imitation, or for example, um, you know, gestural use or joint attention, that they start off at these very much more um, primitive levels and become increasingly sophisticated over time. Um, but it's harder to explain, and I've never or had a good way to understand eye contact, because I'm not really sure that eye contact in six-month-olds is really different than eye contact in 12-month-olds. It feels, if you're in with the babies, it feels really solid and normal and like they're really there and they're really engaging and they're really looking at you in the same way it would in a 12-month-old. So I think while we could say about many of the behaviors that over time they mature into really different forms that probably do actually rely on different neural circuits. I, I am not quite so sure about some of the really primitive behaviors that we also see decline over time. It's very interesting, but yeah, I appreciate your, your input. I agree with it. Now, Doctor, in all your findings and other findings, can you really pinpoint what causes autism in children of all walks of life? you all came to a conclusion, what really causes this? I'll figure it out. Well, okay, keep talking, good, good, I like it, it's great, that's great. Um, well, I mean, I think one of the things that we, that this research shows is that genetics really are very powerful. I mean, the recurrence risk is 20 times higher than it is in the general population, so it is showing us that genetics, which we already knew, but it's, it's um, supporting that, is highly operative. Um, but we already know genetics isn't the only thing. Um, you know, research on twins going back to the 60s, um, so, you know, 60 years ago, showed that identical twins don't always both have autism. They don't have full concordance for it. So we've known for many, many, many years that there are other factors involved. And so now trying to figure out what they are is a really, major focus of research, and in fact, research done here at the MIND Institute. Um, there's a study very similar to our study um, called the Marble Study that focuses on environmental contributions and is really trying very hard to figure out what some of those other causal mechanisms might be beyond genetics. And I know the PI of marbles is sitting right over there, Rebecca Schmidt. So, um, we, so we don't know yet. I don't, I don't know if we have all the smoking guns that there might be, but certainly this research, I think, is, is helping us get a little bit closer. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring it back to your first point where you mentioned that you're tracking from um, 6, 12, 18, 24, and 36 months, but you added additional months, which is the 9th and 15th months. Why did you choose to do that? What um, did you find out that was kind of significant for those months? 
actually, I meant to say this two different times, including on this last slide, but we added the nine and the 15 month visits because children would come in um, who looked perfectly fine at six months, and at 12 months, they would seem like they had so many symptoms. And we realized that that six to 12 month period was really fertile ground. Sorry, I can't see you anymore, but I have to stay near the microphone. Um, for symptom onset and that things were really starting to unfold then. So we added the nine month visit. Unfortunately, the next time that we got funded, it got cut. They actually cut like 20% off the budget. So we had to eliminate that visit, um, unfortunately back out. But it was really because, let's see if I can go back here. No, let me find the right slide, this one. You could see that a lot of things were happening. So all of these kids here, were developing symptoms, right? And then at 15, from between 15, 12 and 18 months, so the 15 month visit would be right here, we have all these kids who look completely fine, and then six months later, tons of symptoms. And in fact, we even diagnosed several children at 15 months. So it was really that, that we realized that we really needed to have more closely timed assessments if we really wanted to catch the symptoms on setting. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.